and turn and share with somebody about your baptism. When was it? Where was it? And how did that, um, do you remember that? Does everyone remember their baptism, right? Where was it? When was it? And like, what did it mean for you? Okay, so, wow, a lot, there's all of a sudden, yeah, it's really empty, all the kids went downstairs. Okay, so just take a moment to explain, uh, discuss that with somebody next to you, right? Your baptism. Yeah, where was it? When was it? What did it mean for you? All right, just by show of hands, I'm curious, just for me, this is purely selfish. How many of you did, did I baptize? Show of hands. Yeah, this side of the room, right? <laughs> um, I remember when I was baptized, it was sixth grade. It was between, um, it was like right at the end of, some, uh, of school year, right at the beginning of summer. And I remember, I'm from Denver, so I was, um, my church had it outside, it was a Cherry Creek Reservoir. So a reservoir is like a man made, you know, they make a dam, uh, they dam off a, a river and make a huge lake out of it. So I was baptized in Church of Reservoir, and I remember bringing a bunch of clothes that day for the whole week because I went to camp, literally from the baptism, straight to camp that night. It was a Sunday night. Um, I remember every part of it, like every single moment of it. I remember what it was like, and this is sixth grade, like I remember very little from sixth grade, but I remember that. Um, what it was felt like to be dunked, I remember who did it, and who was around, and what it felt like, and how the temperature, like I remember everything about it, right? I don't know if that's what, you, what it was like for you. I remember for some of you too, on this side of the room, <laughs> um, your baptisms and some of those days were incredibly cold and there were terrible days to, to do baptisms in the middle of September and other days were done in um, bathtubs and in still water and other things. <laughs> yeah, just really unique stories. Um, baptism. When people think about baptism, um, I, I wonder if a lot of people have confusion about it because they think that the act of baptism is the act of doing something that will help them change. In other words, they think that I'm going to get baptized and when I get baptized, I'm finally going to get control over my sin issue. You know what I mean? Like when I get baptized, that's going to be it. It's going to be the silver bullet right? that's going to put down this werewolf, this am I mixing metaphors here? It's going to put down my sin problem once and for all. I finally get control of this thing. But it doesn't take too long to discover for a lot of people that when they get baptized, it's not what they thought. Like, how come I still struggle with sin? How come I still have this, these issues that I have? Um, we, we sometimes think about a, bap a baptism or maybe other activities that we, that we do that are good things, like going to church or whatever it is. And we find these difficult things that don't really solve our sin issue. Because deep change, like changing and transforming from being like the person that you wish you weren't, right? To being the kind of person that you feel like you should be as a Christian. That can be elusive. That can be difficult to become. So let me ask you, does this sound familiar for some of us or for many Christians? Which is a cycle of, number one... Trying harder, number two, failing miserably, number three, feeling terrible, number four, making promises to do better next time, which leads back to number one, trying harder, failing miserable, right? Uh, feeling terrible, trying uh, promises to do better next time. And it's a cycle that continues over and over and over again, as if we're trying to be better people. Why can't I just be a better person? Christian. And eventually the cycle becomes tiresome. Eventually the cycle becomes, man, it's not working because it doesn't. Uh, let's think about this for a second. What does it mean to try harder? When we're, when we're in this cycle of why aren't I being a good person, the kind of Christian that I want to be, why do I still have sin issues? Well, trying harder for some people means just avoiding sin. Let me just remove myself from the equation. Let me get out of the way. Let me avoid the things that I shouldn't, you know, drive down different streets. Um, don't, you know, don't think about these. Uh, avoid certain channels, you know, whatever. Don't listen to certain music. Don't talk to certain people. So avoiding is the answer in their, 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 uh, in their mind. 
I'm going to fight this by staying away. And I bet some people have some success in that, right? I, I, you know, I'm not as bad of a person as I was because I just stay away from it. But the problem, problem with that is you still, you know, it works for some people, but it only works for a time. And the reason why it only works for a time is this, is because you're still in a relationship with sin. And your relationship with sin may not be like, yeah, let's do it, but rather you have to keep it at arm's length. And you actually have to move your life around and surround your life around not engaging with sin. So you still have a relationship with it. It's just that it's one of avoiding it. You see what I mean? So here we have this problem of trying to be a better person, trying to be this, you know. The problem is sin is, is still very much alive in our life. And we're just trying to keep it at arm's length. So, what happens next for that person who plays this game of this cycle? What happens next is that, well, we think, listen, I've been good for a long time. I've avoided that. I've kept it at arm's length. I've looked away. But you know what? I've been good enough. And what, is it, what does it hurt that maybe for a moment I slip and I go back to this and just see what it's like for, for a second? I deserve that, right? We kind of trick our minds into thinking, Man, I was good so long that I deserve to be bad for once. It's kind of like that dieting thing, right? It's like, I have stayed away from chocolate for so long. I have stayed away from whatever, fill in the blanks, sugary drinks for so long. I deserve this one day where I can, you know, fall off the fence for a moment. And then I'll get back on. Um, it's kind of like that mentality of like a fish, right? You're in the middle of a lake and you know that, you know, a, a little piece of corn should not be floating out there in the middle of the lake. But you're like, you know what? I've been out in this middle of the lake for the, the longest time, and I've been eating flies for so long. I deserve to eat some yummy corn. And you know better, right? You're a fish, and you should know better. As a fish, I guess. <laughs> and you start to nibble. You're like, yum. But here's the problem with that, right? What's the problem with that? Eventually you're like, man, this is so good. Ha boom! And you eat it and you swallow it. And we always know that sin always, always, always has a hook. Has a hook in the middle of it. It's hidden. You oftentimes can't see it, but it will reel you in. We know this. And yet we still have our problems with dealing with sin. There's always this hidden, hidden hook. So this cycle of having this trying harder, feeling miserable, making promises, it just, right, it's, it's a failing strategy to deal with our sin issue. Our cycle of this ongoing relationship with madam sin, it's a losing battle. And we're just, we just get tired of it. But the gospel isn't about you trying harder. The gospel is something else. And so we're going to look back and following up in Romans. We're in chapter 6, which follows up directly with where we were last week with chapter 5. But I encourage you to look at this solution to actual, real change. Aren't you guys ready for real change, right? Are you sick and tired of this meaningless, tiresome effort that doesn't get you anywhere? Paul has a solution for us. God has a solution for us that Paul writes in Romans 6. So, as you're turning there, let me explain what he talked about last week, just briefly. We talked about being in Adam. So what does it mean to be in Adam? It means that one man's decision in Adam to disobey God affected the whole human race. And he is, Adam is our first representative because we're in Adam and his, his decision represents our consequence. Um, but the good news is that there was a second Adam, right? The second Adam, the new man, is Jesus Christ. And in him, when we're no longer in Adam, but we're in Christ, that he now is our representative, he bears the sin of all men, and we now are, are, have a new relationship uh, with God because of Jesus Christ. So that's what 5 was all about. And what 5 uh, really talked about was that the penalty of sin has been eliminated. We were un because we were in Adam, we bore his penalty. 
But as we move into chapter 6, we now move to something even better, which is not just the legal part of it, that we are no longer bound to the penalty of sin, right? Like, like going before a judge and going to jail, and, you know, that's the penalty. But something even better, which is the power of sin. So chapter 6 talks about that we are not only just uh, free from the penalty of sin, but we can be free from the power of sin. Good news today. Um, uh, three times in this chapter, we see that Paul refers to freedom from sin. If you look at verse 7, we'll read this whole thing in a second, but look at verse 7, it says, uh, since a person who has died is freed from sin, again in verse 18, he talks about freedom from sin, you have been set free from sin, and even in chapter 1, verse uh or I'm sorry, in verse 22, he says, freedom from sin, uh, but now since you have been set free from sin. So the topic that he continues to bring up over and over again in chapter 6 is a freedom from sin. That is something that we long for. That's something that is so, seems to be so elusive for us. And here he has the answer, that being in Christ, um, moving from uh, chapter 5, being in Christ, has far-reaching, transformative consequences in our lives. This is great, great news for us today. So, there's two arguments that he's going to bring up. The first is baptism, which is kind of why we started with asking you, thinking about your baptism. And the second argument has to do with slavery. And we'll get to that very briefly today. But, um, new life in Christ, baptism, and slavery. So there's four things I want to pull out for you guys today from, from chapter 6. And the first thing I want to pull out for you is that baptism shows our death. The second thing, that baptism shows our, uh, our, let's see, baptism shows our death. Second, baptism shows our union with Christ. Um, number three, baptism shows us new life. And number four, slavery shows our commitment to righteous living. Okay, so we'll go over those four things in just a second. Number one, baptism shows our, our death. Um, shows our death to ourselves. Let's go ahead and read this passage. Uh, so follow along with me. If you have a Bible app, I use the Christian Standard Bible. If you want to read the exact translation, but your translation, you know, uh, is perfectly fine too. Chapter 6, verse 1. What should we say then? Should we continue in sin so that grace may multiply? <laughs> Absolutely not. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Or are you unaware? that all of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death. Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from, dead, from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in the likeness of his death, we will certainly also be in the likeness of his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin may be rendered powerless so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin. Since a person who has died is freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him because we know that Christ, having been raised from the dead, will not die again. Death no longer rules over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all time. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you too consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its desires and do not offer its parts of it to sin as weapons for unrighteousness, but as those who are alive from the dead, uh, offer yourselves to God and all the parts of yourself to God as weapons for righteousness. I love that phrase, weapons for righteousness. You look at your hand and like, this is a weapon for righteousness. Right? Let's, let's go offer parts of yourself to God as weapons for righteousness. For sin will not rule over you because you are not under the law but under grace. What then? Should we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? Absolutely not. 
Don't you know that if you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey, either of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. But thank God that although you used to be slaves of sin, you obeyed from the heart that pattern of teaching to which you were handed over. And having been set free from sin, you became enslaved to righteousness. I'm using a human analogy because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you offer the parts of yourself as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater lawlessness, so now offer them as slaves to righteousness, which leads, uh, which results in sanctification. We'll end there. So four things I want to mention from this. First three are about baptism. Okay, you notice he talks about baptism, which is like, what's up this, with, with this reference to baptism? We're talking about having new life in Christ, and here he talks to about baptism. Verse 2, uh, he says, or verse 1, should we continue to sin that grace may multiply? So in chapter 5, he talked about that. He's like, man, with all the sin, Christ took on all the sin. He's the greater Adam. He's done better. He's done greater and better things than Adam has. And when he's taken all this and he's turned it into, you know, he's uh, from that, uh, grace is multiplied even more than, uh, than sin. So you take something terrible and turns into something even better than the badness of sin, a greater good. So then he's like, well, cool. Why shouldn't I then just sin even more if God turns that from bad into even good? He's like, that's ridiculous thinking. That's such ridiculous thinking. And here's why. The reason why is because we should be dead to sin. Um, baptism, I want you to think about baptism. Why, uh, where does baptism happen? What has to be present for baptism to happen? Water. Water, very good. Thank you. It can happen like where, uh, it, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. We talked about it in homes or outside or in a church or wherever, but there has to be water. Like that's the one thing. Now, what does water signify in the Bible? It signifies death. In fact, large bodies of water always signify death. Uh, maybe not always, but there's certainly a, 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 a barrier between us and God's blessing and sometimes death. Let me give you an example. Remember uh, 2,000 years before Jesus, a guy named Moses. Let my people go, right? And the Israelite people, they e exit out from their Egyptian slave masters, and they're going, going through the desert and going to the promised land. And what, is, what does Pharaoh do? He changes his mind. He's like, you know what? I kind of miss my slaves. Let's go get them. So he sends his chariots out to go get the Israelite people. They're heading to the promised land. And what stands in their way? The Red Sea. This body of water that represents imminent death. There's, <laughs> it's a, a rock and a hard place, right? It's the, the Egyptian army on one side and this body of water on the other side. represents death. Just so happens that God does what? He parts the sea. He, he, he gets death out of the way in order for them to have life. Another example we see is Jesus. He's sitting in a boat. His disciples, right, are there in the boat with him. And all of a sudden this you know, epi epic storm, this, you know, blizzard bomb, isn't that what they called it, <laughs> right? Uh, they came through uh, the plains in, in Denver, right? This epic storm comes over the Sea of Galilee, whips up the waves, it says that the little boat was so swamped, right, it almost capsizes, it almost drowns them. And the, these disciples, who, by the way, are seasoned fishermen who understand water, are terrified, they are freaking out, and they wake up Jesus. Teacher, they say, don't you care if we drown? Water, death, don't you care that we die? Uh, here's another one, this is fascinating. Re Revelation 21.1 says this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the her first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. Why no more sea? Why is there no sea in heaven, right? Or in the new earth? Because there's no death in the new earth, right? Big bodies of water represent death. So I don't want you to lose this concept because when we come into baptism, we are taking on the death of Christ. 
Bapt uh, it says this, look at verse 3. Or are you unaware that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Um, let's talk about death for a second. I hate funerals. I'm sure many of you, it's not your favorite thing. You would rather be, you know, go to Mall America or something than rather than go to a funeral. It's not my favorite thing, right? Um, now, when we look at uh, a dead person, and I hope this is not disrespectful, but what can a dead person do? What can they do? There's only one thing they can do, and that is to make a stink of the rule. That was really the only thing that a dead person can do, so I forgive me if that's sort of disrespectful. But that's really, they can't do anything. The, the definition of a dead person is that they are completely unresponsive to stimuli. Completely unresponsive. At funerals, right? There's a, a person, what, they come up by the dead person, and they sit in a chair, and they cry, and they weep, and they like, might stroke their, their forehead and kiss them on the cheek. Or, I don't know, maybe they didn't like the guy and they come and slap him on the forehead and, you know, <laughs> spin on their cheek. I don't know. Um, but they're, they, what else do they do? They sit by there and they, they whisper secrets. Oh, I wish I would have told you this two years ago, right? And guess what, what, what that means to the dead person? Nothing. Because they're completely unresponsive to any stimuli. You can talk to them, you can you know, cry in front of them and whisper deep, deep, dark secrets, and it means nothing to a dead person. Because they're dead! Okay? Listen, we, I'm, as Christians, that's what the Bible tells us. We need to be dead to sin. Completely unresponsive. There is nothing sin can do to poke us or, or, or woo us or tell us how wonderful we were in life or come back to me. Sin has no power over us. We need to be dead to it. Right? God says, you know, we, we think, we think, oh, you know, my, my relationship with sin is just try harder to stay away from it. My relationship to sin should be just avoid it and keep it at arm's length. But God says your relationship to sin is not to simply avoid it, but to crucify it and kill it. We need to be dead to it. Okay? Our problem, if we still have problems with sin, is that we still think we're alive to it. Our problem with sin is that we are not dead to it. We still have a relationship with it. In a certain church, there was a narrow, bigoted old deacon. And this deacon was stuck in the old ways, and he didn't want... You know, he was very suspicious of anything new. And James, we'll call him, James was quick to judgment uh, and refused to be ruled by any other view of Scripture. And he had just a barren, dark soul. Uh, one day, a young man came to church, and he was just blessed by God, and he had so much life and, and newness, and the souls were being saved, and he was really good at motivating people. And inevitably, there was a clash between this old deacon and this young person coming in who had that Spirit of God in him. Their views didn't coincide. So for years, the old deacon would criticize and discourage and oppose this younger uh, minister. One day, I mean, this is obvious to the whole church, right? Churches are not dumb. They see what's going on. Uh, this is obvious to the church. And so one day, a member came up to the young man and said, Why? you put up with James? Why do you put up with his criticism and his anger and his discouragement of you? William, he replied to this man, he said this, I died to James five years ago. <laughs> I love that. It's, now, to, to many of us, we like, wow, that's disrespectful. Aren't you supposed to, like, you know, respect your elders and your deacons and people in authority over you and things like, is this a disrespectful thing? I think for people who are manipulative and power hungry, they think it's a disrespectful thing. But I think this young man would say, my God is Jesus Christ. My, what motivates me is not to be motivated by approval from man, but from God alone. Amen? 
See, he, it, it, whether you are sinned against or we have sin struggles within, we need to be dead to sin. And it will lose its power over you. It will no longer have a foothold in your life. Um, keep in mind, right? This is exactly what Christian baptism is all about. We are buried in Christ. And Paul makes it clear that this is not like a self-cleansed diet, right? Like, if I do baptism and I go through this thing, I'm just going to try this thing and it's going to make me, you know, more, I'm going to try harder. And baptism was one of my try harder things. It is not that at all. To take on Christ's death means to completely associate with him. It is his death. It is not my trying harder. It is his death. Uh, crucifixion life, uh, crucifixion that I'm taking on. All of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus, we see in, in verse 4, we are um, uh, uh, buried with him. We are buried into Christ Jesus and baptized into his death. So, why does the struggle still exist? Why, why do we have it? And I think what we find here is Paul says it's an, an issue of ignorance. Look at verse 3. Are you, what's that word? Unaware. For some of your versions it says, don't you know? Don't you know? Okay? In fact, he mentions this, uh, this question uh, again in verse 16, three times. Don't you know? And this one is verse, chapter 7, verse 1. He says, don't you know? Paul is telling us that the spiritual reality of Christ coming and freeing us from sin hasn't sunk in here. We a little bit slow, right? <laughs> We're a little bit dumb to the truth. Now, here's something interesting in science. Um, did you know, and this is just honestly kind of, kind of gross, okay? Did you know, we're talking about death a lot today, sorry. Did you know that when you die, that when your heart stops beating, it actually takes about, on average, 20 to 30 seconds for your brain to also stop. In other words, you know you're dying. <laughs> right? Isn't that creepy? But apparently new evidence shows us that this can last even up to 10 minutes. That your mind, right, can still be going even while your body has passed. Ugh, it's kind of weird to think about, right? Um, Ten minutes after death. And the, the good news is this, is um, we're not sure if that's a conscious, they can just uh, measure brain function. They're not sure if it's a conscious brain function or not. So that's good. But my point of bringing that up is that same thing is happening with us in our Christian life. Why are we still, a, we should be dead to sin, but in our minds we think we're still alive. To it. Paul says, your mind hasn't caught up with the truth. Don't you know? Don't you know? Don't you know who you are? Don't you know what Christ has done for you? Don't you know that when you were baptized, you died with Christ? So that's our first point. <laughs> Baptism shows us that we're die that we die. Christians are, are, are first dead, but that's not the only truth. The second truth is that uh, in addition to us being dead to sin, we are alive in Christ. Let me see what are my, my four points up to make sure I got them right. That, that, baptism shows our death. Baptism shows our union with Christ. So this is our third point. Baptism shows us our new life in Christ. Um, this is beautiful. Verse 4 and 5. Look at verse 4 and 5. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. Why? Not so that we can go around saying, we're dead to sin, but more than that, that's step one. Because when you're baptized down in the water, we ain't leaving you there. Right? I was so nice that I actually pulled you back up. And that's biblical. That's the way it should be. Why do we pull you back up? Because the, we, what, what, we buried with Christ in order that, right? Uh, buried with him by baptism and death, verse 4, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too may walk in newness of life. That's awesome, guys. 4, verse 5, For if we have been united with him in the likeness of a death, we will certainly also be in the likeness of his resurrection. 
Now, we talked about this in the men's group a couple of weeks ago, uh, going through Luke, right? Talking about Jesus' baptism. And I don't recall if, guys, we had hit on this point, but this, this point's awesome, okay? This is so good. Jesus' baptism is totally unlike anybody else's baptism. Now, why? Why is that? Here's why. Because when you were baptized, the sky didn't rip open, and he, you know, the Holy Spirit didn't fly down like a dove, and a voice from heaven didn't call out to you saying, um, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. You remember that? That's what happened at Jesus' baptism. So let's talk about this for a second. This is really cool. Okay. Jesus' baptism. A voice and the spirit over the water. What does that remind you of? When did we first hear God's voice and the spirit over the water? Turn to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. It's in the beginning of your Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 2, now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness covered the surface of the watery depths. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the water. Remember what water represented? Death. God is over it. He's going to make something from what's dead. And it's, uh, all of a sudden the creation story comes. He brings life out of it. What's, what, there's nothing that can happen there. And God brings life, life from it. But, and verse, verse 3. And then, then God said. You see, when Jesus was baptized, the exact same creation story symbols from creation, or not symbols, but activities from creation are happening at Jesus' baptism. You see, the, the voice from God, the spirit over the water, is the beginning of creation. And Jesus' baptism is recreation. There is new creation. There is new life. Because we were in chapter 5 Romans, we are under Adam. Here in Genesis chapter 1, it's the story of first man. It's us. It's, first, it's un in Adam. But now we are in Christ. It is brand new. Does that strike you as, as awesome to you as it does to me? Paul says it this way in Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if, it's, if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? new creation. The old has gone. The in Adam is gone. The of Adam, being, him being our representative, that is eliminated. The old man, the old sin, the old definition of what meant us and motivated us is gone. And the new has come. Jesus Christ is our Lord. Amen. I need an amen from somebody. Thank you. Oh. When you're baptized, you are, pre you are participating both in Christ's death, but in new creation. Have you forgotten? Don't you know, Paul says. Haven't you forgotten? You're new. You're dead to sin. Verse 11 then, he says, So you too, you too also, Consider yourselves. Think about it. Reframe how you see yourself. Are you, Christian, alive to God in Christ? Or is sin still your master? It ain't your master. It ain't your master. Okay? Where am I? I'm going to get to our last point here. Um, last point. Slavery shows, that our, shows our commitment to righteous living. Like, whoa, what, wait, Chris, what did you say? Slavery shows our commitment to righteous living. Uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> Let me try to explain this one. Let's look in verse 15. Okay, we're, we're uh, skipping some of this part, but that's okay. What then? Should we, should we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? Absolutely not. 
Don't you know that if you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey, either in sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. So he shifts, Paul shifts his argument about freedom in Christ being, you know, baptism being the example, to now the example of the slave. So let's talk about slavery for a second. The reason why slavery for us, and this is a difficult concept, it's the way that the people reading this the first time would have would see it far differently from the way we see it, is because when we think of slavery, we think of the deep south, right? The deep south, it's racial. It's all about white bodies having supremacy over black bodies. And, you know, uh, there's abuse, there's uh, death, there's punishment, there's all sorts of things like that. And so our, um, you know, our U.S. history and um, our, our understanding of, of racial tensions in America, and that's our understanding of where slavery can, comes from. But the Bible's understanding of slavery is far different. Because in Bible times, a person would actually, actually offer themselves into slavery. So if a person was in just extreme debt, for instance, and they just had no way out of paying their debt, they might come to a master and offer themselves kind of, it sounds like a job, but it's, it, it is actual like servitude. Like he becomes my master uh, and everything he says I do. But it came with some rules. Uh, there are rules around treatment of slaves, right, in, in America, there, that just didn't happen, I guess, right? Uh, there's also a time limit to it. So you would have your freedom after a certain amount of time or if a certain amount of money was made. Uh, so the, the way, you know, indentured servitude is a far better way, uh, if you remember your U.S. history, right? It's a better way of, of describing it. Um, and by all means, uh, if you have more insight than that, correct me if I'm wrong. So we need to understand that it's just different from American South 200 years ago. And the reason I bring this up is that I don't want you to get hung up on this example of slave for a second. Paul was talking about slavery, you're like, oh my gosh, the Bible promote slavery. Well, yes, in the way that the Bible understood slavery, okay? So that's really important. And when Paul uses the slave analogy, he's showing this, that everyone has a master. Everyone has a master. Now, we uh, Western individualized thinking people think to ourselves that, no, that's not true. I am the master of my own destiny. Everything I want, I can do. I have total freedom and nothing is the master of me. But the truth of the, of the fact is that that's not true. We are all slaves to something or some idea or someone. Doesn't matter. And so he sees that there's two people in the world. People who are slaves to God and people who are slaves to something else. Okay? Verse 16. Don't you know that if you offer yourself, okay, again, see the biblical understanding of slavery isn't a self-offering like you, you say, I am giving myself to you. If you offer yourself, he says, uh, yourself to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey either of sin leading to death, or obedience leading to righteousness. Um, oops, last picture. And so we ask ourselves this, this question. Why, this whole point of this message, why is it so hard for me to change? Why is it so hard for you to change? Right? You want to be the good person, the good Christian you want to be, why can't that happen? And Paul says the reason why is because you still have a slave mentality. And what do I mean by a slave mentality? I want you to imagine for a second if there's a nation that, and you know, I don't know if imagine this happens, a nation where slavery is the rule. Like anybody can own a slave, and there's just a whole population of oppressed people who are slaves. And then a king comes in, or a, a new ruler comes in and says, you know what? We're going to banish that. There are going to be no more slaves. You know, there's fireworks and there's rejoicing in the street. And yeah, you know, you know for centuries there was slavery and now we, we have emancipation. It's everyone's free. That's great news, right? Except what difference does it make? Does it make a difference for that generation? Yes and no. And here's why I mean by and no. 
Because if the oppressors would walk down the street, right, the, the masters, then the people who were oppressed might get out of the way, might feel a little anxious, might feel a little, you see? Because yes, in truth, right, the reality is that that person who was oppressed could stand up and say, no, you can't, you know, you can't intimidate me the way you used to. You don't have power over me the way you used to, and they'd be completely right. Except that their slave mentality has kept them thinking like they're still a slave. Why is it so hard for you to change out of your sin? Why do we keep coming back to it? The Bible says, says, describes it like this. Like a dog returns, you know this one, to its vomit, so a foolish man returns to his sin. I used to love that one as like a middle schooler. Like, <laughs> ew, dog returns to vomit. Have you seen that before? Like, I had a cat and it would come back and like, it would throw up and it come back and eat it again. That's just super disgusting. And that's the image he gives to, to us of going back to our sin, our old master. We've forgotten that the king has come and declared us free. You might say, um, oh, let me finish with this. Verse 17. But thank God that although you used to be slaves of sin, you obeyed from the heart the pattern of teaching to which you were handed over. So Paul is now complimenting the Roman church that he's writing to. It's like, you guys used to be like, live like crazy Romans. Those guys were party animals. But now you've been having this pattern of teaching and you've been like letting this pattern, what's a pattern? It's a repetition, right? The pattern is like, it keep, you keep doing it over and over again. It's a pattern of teaching that you've been listening to and now you're changing. Now you're different, right? You obey from the heart, the pattern of teaching to which you were handed over. And having been set free from sin, verse 18, you became enslaved to righteousness. You see, the Christian is not about total liberation from everything. It's changing to the right master. It's changing to the right master. And the Bible tells us that it is God who is the best Master, and we become we become agents of righteousness, right? Back to this, right? Like our parts, every part of us, instead of being enslaved by sin, we now have a weapon of righteousness to push back the darkness, to push back the the evil, and to push back the sin. We used to be our master. We say, wait a second, Pastor Chris. You know, I come to church and I'm Christian, but this really trusting God thing, really making him my Lord and my master. I don't know, I have trust issues. How do I know that God has got my back? How do I know that God is actually going to be a better master to me than anything else I've pursued? And some people might, might deep, deep down have trust issues with God that way. We've forgotten how good a master God is. Um, let me tell you this. God is the master that you always wanted and needed. Um, God, th this idea of giving ourselves to God totally for some people feels terrible, but the truth is that we've, we've offered ourselves to so many other things and instead of giving us freedom, they've enslaved us. God is the only good master who's come and fully freed us, right? And serving him. We are free. Let me close with an example of why that, of how that's true, and what that looks like. There's a movie that came out in 1999. It's called Three Seasons. And it's about what happened in Vietnam um, after the war, and uh, Vietnam was was kind of uh, a mess. Um, but there's there's this movie called Three Seasons. There's four little short stories in it. And one of those uh, short stories is about a cyclo driver, right? Those rickshaw motorcycle drivers. A guy named Hai, H-A-I, right? And he's poor, but he loves Lan. And Lan is a beautiful prostitute. Um, just the way that she needed to survive uh, at that time. They both have these completely unfulfilled desires. Her desire 
is to one day live in the hotels, right? And actually spend the night there without being abused. Like she could live the lifestyle of the people that would spend money to um, take advantage of her. She hates the life, secretly, she hates the life she's in. It's dirty, it's shameful, and she just longs to live in those hotels, but she never can. Um, uh, and it doesn't seem to work for her because the more and more she gives herself away, and the more and more she's being exploited, right? The more and more she loses herself to that life, she's becoming enslaved. Um, the, uh, she hates these men who abuse her, but what, she, what can she do about it? There, uh, later on in the story, Hai, this cycle driver, uh, goes into a race, and he wins a bunch of money, and this money could be the key to helping him get out of this mundane lifestyle where he just has to drive and taxi people around, right? Uh, but instead, he takes this money, and he blows it all on one thing. He buys a hotel room and, uh, for a night with Lan. So, as a moviegoer, you would watch this and you'd expect some rated R scene, right? Where it's going to be like, uh oh, right? Stuff that y'all should not see. <laughs> um, and Lan, the character of Lan, is expecting this too. She needs to go, she's got, you know, to do her duty to, to get the money. But something unexpected happens when she gets there. Hi is in the room, and he welcomes her in, and he says that he doesn't want to sleep with her. He doesn't want to do anything to her. He simply purchased a place for her so she can have a moment where she experiences her dream. He only asks for permission to watch her fall asleep. And when she does, he's gone in the morning, and he hasn't done anything to her. Um, he pays for her to have the moment where she can be in a place where she feels that she should belong. And that is the moment for her to land when she snaps. But in a good way. She can't go back to her life of prostitution. Because having experienced for the first time someone who used his power for her to serve her instead of taking his power to use her, She's finally found dignity. She's finally changed and transformed because of the grace of selfless love. Powerful story. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ has done to you and has done to me. See, Jesus Christ had all the power in the world. And Philippians tells us that what did he do with this power, this, this place of, of grandeur, Right? Heaven. He had everything. Philippians 3 says that he emptied himself and became what? A servant. John tells us that he, he took on the robe and he put it around his waist and he came and he washed the filth off of our feet. He came and he died for us. Jesus laid apart all power, all dignity in order to bring you and I that freedom that we so long for. And so in closing, Paul tells us, you are no longer slaves to sin. You are no longer, you are dead to sin, but, be, but not just dead to sin, you are alive in Christ. And because of the gracious love, the, the, the extraordinary, unrelenting love that we see from God, we can be transformed. How can you not? Have you, do you not know, have you forgotten who you are? Christian. Christian, dead to sin, and alive to God through Christ Jesus. Let's invite my worship team back up and close with the song.
three verses, about four verses here. So what fruit, verse 21, so what fruit was produced from those things that you're now ashamed of? Those, those sinful things. What fruit came of it? He says this, the outcome of those things is death. But now, since you have been set free from sin and have become enslaved to God, you have your fruit, which results in sanctification. And the outcome is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. God, we thank you for your word. We pray, Lord, that the reality of what you've done for us, that we are free in Christ, that we are no longer slaves to sin, would become real in our hearts and in our minds, that we would see ourselves and we think of ourselves as weapons for righteousness, that every part of ourselves, every person in our church would be weapons for righteousness. Love that. Thank you, God. Move us, motivate us to live for you. Thank you for being the good, good master that we need, the one that we need more than anything else. Thank you that results in eternal life. I pray that that eternal life, what that feels like, continues even now. It doesn't start in heaven, it starts now on earth. So we thank you for the life you give us. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.